Okay, American Seminar students, here's my uh, last installment of commentary on our David Brooks article, uh, part four, uh, which covers the last section of the, the reading. Uh, hopefully you found the reading to be valuable to you and, and has made you think a little bit. Uh, so I'll start right away. Uh, again, part four starts with the phrase, two years ago I started something called Weave. Right away, I'm just shocked by the perspective of the Lisa Fitzpatrick, uh, who was shot in the face by gang members. And her response to that was, this wasn't their fault. They need help. I'm going to help these boys who shot me in the face. Man, that's just inspiring, I guess. It's, it's shocking. It, it shows a certain strength that some people have um, to not worry about fault, to not shout in the distance about being screwed over but just trying to address a problem in society and and that that's definitely a good picture of the public good in action um move down from that and uh i like the description of the other side academy the, these felons who get into community and work together and live together and dine together and then you know i really like the the games situation um where they call each other out for moral failure. Um, now, again, I, there's a sentence in the middle of that paragraph. The goal is to transform the character of each family member. Well, the strategy for that is with this forged family, this extended family, essentially saying we need community, not just felons, but all people. We need community in order to transform our character, in order to be better. So even in our individualistic lifestyle, we need those things. And, and what they got in this program and what it's saying essentially we need is um, people to work with, people to dine with, and people willing to call out our moral failures or to call us out for, for anything where, where we need to get better. Uh, and so it just made me want to ask, how many of us have that in our lives? How many of us are in situations where we do have people to work with, um, whatever that may look like? How many of us have people to regularly dine with? And how many of us have somebody who's willing to call you out? Um, now, some of you think that every day you come to American Seminar class in school, you've got me to call you out. And, and to a certain extent, I'm sure that, that that's true. Um, but how many of you have someone in your life who's willing to say, you know what, this isn't good enough. Uh, you, you need to be better. And, and because I am part of your family or your forged family, I'm willing to tell you today's the day to get better at that. It was clear that that was something that mattered in terms of character development and something that only a strong community in your life uh, can provide for you. Uh, and I liked the, the description of, of when it was over, uh, you know, after they had this games situation. Uh, but after the anger, there's a kind of closeness that didn't exist before. Men and women who have never had a loving family suddenly have relatives who hold them accountable and demand a standard of moral excellence. Extreme integrity becomes a way of belonging to the clan. The Other Side Academy provides unwanted people with an opportunity to give care and creates out of that care a ferocious forged family. Man, that last sentence. Uh, first of all, ferocious forged family. May we all have that. A ferocious forged family. And then also recognizing that in this ferocious forged family, there's the opportunity to give care. That's an essential part of this. The development, not just of being supported, but being given the opportunity to support, the responsibility to support. That improves our character. Not just having the support, but being the support. That strengthens us as well. Uh, moving on from there, um, I... You know, he starts talking about the David and Kathy and and the, the people that they bring in. Uh, and, and he brings, uh, there's this sentence. In the early days, the adults in our clan served as parental figures for the young people, replacing their broken cell phones, supporting them when depression struck, raising money for their college tuition. When a young woman in our group needed a new kidney, David gave her one of his. This is inspiring. This is wonderful. But if we're going to move to this as a society, if this is going to be a reality, what this requires is for the haves and the healthy to not be self-centered. 
This requires the haves and the healthy to find the have-nots and the sick and say, I want to help. It requires of people to be proactive, to not be individualistic, to not be self-focused. And there's no crime in being self-focused, but can we as an American society, can the haves and the healthy be on the lookout for people who don't have what they have? Uh, and that's the real challenge. I mean, yes, this is a nice picture of the way things could and should be maybe from David Brooks, but it will require the haves and the healthy to be on the lookout, to be active in that pursuit. Uh, we then go, the text really focuses on economics again. You can't escape the economic factors. The richest countries are the most lonely. The countries who have the most community have less money. And so, uh, again, I, the, the statements, the market wants us to live alone or with just a few people. The market improves when that happens. Uh, and then also, people who are raised in developed countries, when they get money, they buy privacy. And yet, David Brooks would argue privacy uh, may be one of the hardest things for us to deal with. Um, today's crisis, he writes, her, the today's crisis of connection flows from the impoverishment of family life. Getting money leads to community impoverishment. So it's an, it's an interesting idea. Uh, we go to the end, and the last sentence made me consider our, our current situation. It's time to find ways to bring back the big tables. Well, as Americans now, as, as Iowans, everybody everywhere is at small tables right now. We're, we're doing this whole social distancing thing. Um, and, and so even if we have extended families, we're forced to not be a part of that. I wanna know what this is gonna look like when this is over or, or when we're finally out of uh, these requirements, this, this social distancing. Most of us will have been trained up to have our own way. What will we do when we don't? Uh, I mean, I'm curious. Right now, you have a ton of freedom. Uh, you can choose when you want to learn, how you want to learn, if you want to learn. What will be the response when you're required to show up to class every day again? Most of us, uh, those who are not required to show up to a job, who, who aren't given a schedule, we have a lot of personal choice about our schedule. And, and we're in our own head a lot, and our basic needs are up to us. How will we respond? I mean, yes, a lot of people predict this desperation to go be around other people, and, and, and I agree, there's going to be a lot of that. But when push comes to shove, how are we going to respond to not having isolation anymore? Will we want the community after we realize? that it costs something from us, that it means some inconvenience. Uh, and that's really the crux of this article, that community costs you something, um, but man, privacy and individualism, David Brooks would argue that costs you even more. And our pursuit of individualism and our pursuit of money runs completely counter to the idea of community. Uh, and, and in some ways you, you kind of have to choose. So those are my final comments on the, on the article, on the reading. Uh, again, I hope you're writing about it. I hope you're getting some words down about it. And I'd, I'd love to, to read them. So thanks for watching and, and let me know what you thought of the article.